Oh, welcome back. The topic today is to discuss further the uh, imp application of neural networks to uh, project number two, and also mention something about the uh, uh, quantum path integral project. So we have uh, basically two project projects, and uh, we are going to uh, deal uh, with this uh, in, in the group work as well. There's not so much theory, more theory, which we need to cover, but I wanted to discuss a little bit more in detail today uh, some of the technicalities around the neural networks and Boltzmann machine uh, project. And then uh, for those of you who uh, aim at doing the quantum path integral project, this is something which we can discuss more on a one-to-one -one basis when we meet at the lab sessions. Also today is going to be the last time we run typical uh, lecture set uh, type of uh, 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 session and from next week and on uh, we are just going to deal with a, a lab session where we can split them into breakout rooms and we will do that from uh, two o'clock in the afternoon till seven o'clock in the afternoon if that's okay with everybody <coughs> so we will have a, a lab continuously from uh, uh, 2 15 to uh, seven o'clock okay so if we go back a little bit to the main overview here and we uh, take a closer look at uh, the projects themselves uh, you will find uh, the two uh, alternatives and the first alternative if we look at the uh, deep learning uh, version of it uh, this is essentially us looking at uh, two particles so we're going to look at two electrons or two bosons the type of wave function for the ground state is going to be a symmetric wave function so there is no kind of uh, Pauli principles which need to be accounted for because the Pauli principle will reside in the spin part now your Hamiltonian does not depend on spin so there is no need to overcomplicate life and we can simply focus on a system of uh, two identical particles, and these could be electrons or bosons. So if we are going to look at the ground state only, and we have a two-dimensional isotropic harmonic oscillator, which is the case which we had in project one as well, then the only difference now with, between project one and uh, this version of the project is that we are changing the Hamiltonian so that we have a repulsive Coulomb interaction, which uh, is the interaction between the two objects, the, either bosons or, or, or fermions. So you can think of this if you want to link this with two electrons, this could be two electrons in a harmonic oscillator trap, which is a very popular model for studying, uh, as a, for studying uh, quantum computing and uh, actually as an alternative to superconducting qubits uh, many people now actually developing uh, systems based on uh, trapped electrons or trapped ions in order to uh, be able to uh, define specific uh, systems as qubit 1 and qubit 0. So this, is, uh, this kind of physical system uh, is, has been studied quite a lot experimentally. There are many, many theoretical studies. And the nice thing in two dimensions is that we do have an analytical answer. So if we set this oscillator frequency to uh, 1, as we are going to do here, the exact answer is going to be free atomic units. So that means that if we look at the non-interacting case, uh, the non-interacting case has actually just two uh, uh, atomic units. And typically, uh, the uh, type of uh, non-interacting problem to which we know the solution which in this case is going to be two atomic units when we put h bar omega equal to one that is has a wave function which is now given by the product of two harmonic oscillators and uh, we know that from project one that this is actually the exact answer so what we are going to do now is to represent and i'm going to switch over to the whiteboard pretty soon uh, we are going to represent the wave functions in terms of a neural network so one of the types of neural networks we're going to look at is normally what is called a Boltzmann machine. And I'm going to go through the details a little bit again. And then we're going to look at the code example, which you will find in the lecture notes. And with that code example, we can actually then uh, get started with what is needed. So we are going to uh, 
define our wave function, which will consist of uh, an ansatz based on something which is called a Gaussian binary uh, Boltzmann machine. And I'm going to explain this a little bit more in detail on the, on the whiteboard. And the wave function can then be given by simply this distribution, or we can represent it with the uh, uh, wave function squared to be equal to that distribution. And we are coming back to the details. So the first thing is actually to set up the uh, uh, cost function, which in our case is going to be the uh, derivative of the uh, energy, the expectation value of the energy. And that's the same quantity which we have been calculating before. So we would need to uh, reuse that from our codes. And we are going to simply run uh, that system with a trial wave function, which will be given simply by this Gaussian binary one. Then later on, we can actually improve upon that. The next things which we need to do is to bake in important sampling. And then we need to do the statistical analysis, which typically would be done with a blocking method. You could also do bootstrap if you want to do that. So in a certain sense, it's actually a, a, a repetition of what we did in project number one, except that now the trial wave function is going to be different. Now, what I've also plugged in here is an optional part where we replace the Boltzmann machine with a neural network. And this is something which we can discuss depending on where you are after you have implemented the Boltzmann machine. So you can view this as a kind of a bonus exercise, uh, which actually leads to the more interesting case. But since not everybody has implemented a neural network, I was thinking that this could be an optional part, which we can discuss in more detail at the lab sessions as well. And then we can go through some of these de uh, topics in more detail. So this is essentially the uh, uh, neural network variant of project number two. Then there is a uh, path integral project, which uh, some of you have uh, expressed an interest to work on. And in the beginning here, depending on how much you know about the path integral formalism, there is a description of the uh, basic equations which uh, uh, are needed to be encoded. And if you scroll down a little bit, the uh, first case here is actually to look at the harmonic oscillator as a simple example. And we do know the energy here. So what I'm proposing is actually to look at the harmonic oscillator in uh, simply in uh, one dimension. And we know the answer to that one. Uh, we have that from project one as well. So the uh, uh, first part is actually to try to implement a, uh, a path integral approach to the harmonic oscillator where you actually need to calculate the uh, expected value of the form of a two-point correlator. And that's something you can then relate to the energy later on. So that means that you actually need to calculate if you discretize this on a lattice, which is close to what you would like to do at the at the end with this Heisenberg model. So we are going to place the harmonic oscillator uh, in a discretized version on the lattice. And that means that we need, in order to relate uh, the, the quantities we calculate to an energy, we would then need to calculate this something which is called a two-point correlator. And uh, with that, we can then calculate the energy we can then run this for a series of configurations and we can do bootstrap or blocking in order to uh, get better estimates of the, uh, uh, of the energy. Now, one thing which can be done next, and this is actually pretty useful, and it links back with uh, what you guys did in project number one, and that's to link uh, with the, uh, you can actually simulate Brownian motion with the Langevin equation. There's also something which is called hybrid Monte Carlo, which many people have used. And this is partly described here. So depending on how much time we have, uh, this is something which uh, can be omitted or can be done. Uh, and again, I would propose that uh, we, uh, in the group sessions, we actually discuss this in more detail and how you're going to proceed. And then finally, there is the, uh, the third part here, which deals more with the topic uh, you, Joao, and uh, and uh, and Johan have have defined, 
And the, uh, in that specific case, we're actually looking at the Heisenberg model. So we can discuss whether we want to skip this part 2B if it's too much, and then just want to jump over to part 2C. But the first part uh, functions as a kind of warm up for you. And we are going to set up the basic uh, formalism, which is needed, or codes, which are needed in order to uh, simulate harmonic oscillate on a lattice. And when you have done the simulation on the lattice, it's then uh, pretty straightforward actually to move on to another type of Hamiltonian, which is discretized on the lattice. So these are essentially the two projects. And after the uh, uh, discussion of the uh, neural network uh, project today, we are then just going to have uh, uh, lab sessions for the rest of the semester. And the last uh, lab session which we are going to have is going to be the week of uh, May 99 to 30. So the thing which I wanted to do now is actually to bring back the uh, whiteboard. So I'm just going to stop sharing here. and Let me bring up the whiteboard so that we can uh, go through some of the details. And then we're going to look back at the codes which we need uh, or the code which or the basic ingredients in the coding which we will need. So let me just bring this up. So when we look at the Boltzmann machines, the Boltzmann machines are actually the uh, easiest uh, type of neural network to implement. So the Boltzmann machine. And the reason why this is easier to implement than just a plain neural network is that the, the structure which we have from project number one can actually be tailored almost immediately to this specific project. So what we did in project one is that we had a trial wave function, psi of t of r of alpha, which was then given by, in our case, we had just one variational parameter, essentially, which was given by a one body part, phi of OB. So this is the one body part, and that contained the coordinates of the different particles which we have. And this goes up all the way to Rn, so with n particles. And then in our case, we had just one variational parameter for this one, but we can keep this in a general form. And this is multiplied with a correlated part, psi of c for correlations, which also depends on the variables or the positions of the different objects. And normally this depends on the relative distance. And that's because most of the potentials which you have in physics, these are potentials which depend on either the absolute value of the relative distance or the relative distance itself between two particles. You can also have more complicated correlations of the type of three particles, four particles, and so on. But we are mainly going to stay with what we normally call two-body correlations. And these could also depend on some of these variational parameters. So what we had in uh, project number one is that this correlated part of the wave function, alpha, is then given by the product and this would be a product of ij. And then we had some function, which is now given by the relative distance. And normally, this is the magnitude of the relative distance. So let's put it like that. And we have that rij is simply ri minus rj. So that's the relative distance between two particles. And the uh, one body part was simply given by a product of harmonic oscillator functions. So what we had then was something like a minus of alpha, and we would have this alpha squared. So this becomes a variational parameter. And then we had this ri. And let's now write it like, out like this. So this will go from i equal 1 up to n. And this had an ri squared. And in two dimensions, this is simply xi squared plus yi squared. This is what we basically did in project one. Now in project two, there are several things we can do when the code is functioning. But what we are going to assume now 
is that our trial wave function is going to be given by a so-called Boltzmann machine. And now I'm going to use a collective variable R for all the positions. So let me just put that as an intermediate one. So that is equal to R1, R2, and all the way up to Rn. And in our case, these parameters, so this function here, so let's just put it equal to that, is going to be given by normally what we call a Boltzmann distribution. So this is going to contain a partition function. And then we are going to put temperature equal to 1, and it's going to contain an energy. And this energy depends now on the, the variables R. And then it's going to contain some hidden variables, H. And then we have the different parameters, which we simply call for theta. And a typical function, which we have this, e, this function E, is going to be given by uh, a set of uh, weights and biases of a given neural network. So the uh, function z is normally what we call a partition function, which is just a normalization constant. And that means that uh, that specific function is now given by the sum, typically, or if this is an integral. So this could be typical integral over d of r1, d of r2, all the way up to d of rn. And then we would have an integral over the different so-called hidden nodes, h1. And this goes up to the number of hidden nodes, d of n. And then it contains this expression for the energy of e to the minus e. And then I'm going to write it out like an r1, r2. And then we have an h1 h2, etc. And finally, we have these parameters theta. So this is the partition function, which we normally never actually deal with because we are using the metropolis algorithm and then we are taking ratios between probabilities. Now, this uh, function, which we are uh, interested in now, this uh, so-called uh, uh, Boltzmann machine function or this energy function, this is something which we normally approximate in a specific way. So we are going to use something in this specific project, something which is called a Gaussian binary. And that means that what we have is a function which is now going to depend on the weights and the biases of a, a specific network. And this is a network which now contains uh, parameters. So we are going to look at the network where we have a set of visible nodes. So we're going to set this up as a visible layer. Now this visible layer is now going to take the coordinates of the different particles. Or two. In our case, we just have two particles. So life is pretty simple. And uh, this visible layer, which we have here, this specific layer here, will have an input for every dimension. So that means that since we are dealing with two dimensions, it means that this quantity here, this R1, is going to split into an X1 and a coordinate Y1. So it means that uh, every input node actually splits into uh, more nodes according to the dimension. So if you're dealing with a one-dimensional problem, then clearly every single input node corresponds to the coordinates of a given particle. So in two dimensions, which is the case we are going to look at, this is going to be a case where we have only uh, two nodes for every position for every single particle. So if we now have two particles, it means that in our case, the number of so-called visible nodes are going to be four. So in our case, where we have n equal to two here, then we need only four input nodes. 
And these input nodes are going to be the uh, positions of the two particles in Cartesian coordinates. So I recommend normally to run the calculations in Cartesian coordinates. So with that, we then, uh, in this specific visible layer, we are going to define parameters in this energy function. So this energy function, E, which is now going to depend in our specific case on R1 and R2. And then we can define as many hidden nodes as we want. But let's just assume that we've set up two hidden nodes. Then we will have a hidden nodes H1 and hidden node H2. And then we're going to have some parameters, theta. And these parameters, theta, they are now going to contain the bias and the weights. So we are going to have the bias. For those of you, and I know that both of you are familiar with the uh, neural networks, so this will be a way to activate a given node in case the uh, output from the specific node itself is by accident is equal to zero. So there will be a bias in the uh, uh, visible layer, and we're just going to call that one for parameter visible, we are going to call that for an A. So that, that is one set of parameter. And we're going to put an I here just to indicate that we can have several such biases. We are going can have a bias for every single input node. And then we are going to have a bias in the uh, hidden layer. So let me just bring this up properly here. So if we now do the hidden layer, just bring up some of my I just need to put up my cheat sheet again I just have to figure out where I put down all these equations in my just a moment I, I have some notes here where I just need to remind myself on my specific notation here so that I, I don't keep changing notation from time to time. So the uh, uh, bias for the visible, for the hidden bias for the hidden layer is going to be given by a quantity bj. And then we have the weights which connect between hidden layer And visible layer. And we are simply going to call this for Wij here. So what is going to happen now is that we are going to use something which is called a Gaussian binary. So in our case we have a Gaussian binary model. And that means that we will have an energy, and now I'm just going to skip all these kind of uh, uh, parameters in the energy expression. So there will be a term which runs like a sum over i equal 1 up to the number of particles which we have and dimensions. So we should actually write this as a times dimension. So d is a dimension of the problem. So in our case, we're going to have four hidden no, four visible nodes so we are going to have a parameter here where we now plug in an x of i multiplied with an a of i so this x of i now takes the role of a common parameter for the different dimensions so it means that we are going to have uh, x of i so if we take one here that will be the x value if we take two it will be the y value of the given uh, a parameter which is coming in then we are going to have now a sum over the uh, hidden layers so we have a j equal one and then we have m hidden nodes multiplied with the dimension of the system so if we have uh, uh, two particles and two dimensions we are going to have four visible uh, nodes and we could then say that we have the same amount of hidden nodes but we are not limited to that. We can actually increase or decrease the number of hidden nodes. But we could start, so the examples which I'm going to show you, we start simply with the uh, 
the same number of hidden nodes as we have uh, for visible nodes. So this is going to contain now a variable h of j, and this is multiplied with a bias, b of j. And then finally, we have the next term, which is now given by a sum over ij. And then we have the total dimensionality of this problem. So this runs from n times d and up to m cross d. And then we were going to have the weights wij. And this is multiplied with the xi and multiplied with hj. So this is the way we are going to model the wave functions in the simplest possible way. So observe now that there is essentially no kind of physics information about this specific function here. So what we have here, this specific, so I should have actually have written that better here. So this is normally called a binary binary. So that means that x of i takes the values, for instance, 0 and 1, and the same with h of i that takes the values 0 and 1. So these are the outputs from these functions. So we can change this binary binary. So if we put a BB here, we can change this to a Gaussian binary. And the difference then is that this term which runs over i equal 1 of n cross d of xi of a of i, that goes over to a new term where we have the same summation and n cross d but now we have an x of i minus this a of i squared and sometimes you can also plug in a variance uh, normally this is a quantity which can be difficult to extract from the uh, the model which we have so many people tend to put that one equal to one but you could assume now that there is some kind of spread in your gaussian distribution now this is the kind of quantity which we are going to use so in our case uh, we are going to use a energy function which is given by a Gaussian binary. Now the uh, quantities which we need to deal with then are uh, one, the derivative of the energy with respect to the variational parameters, which in our case are now the weights and the biases of the network. So instead of you having a variational parameters like we had in project one, the parameters which we need to optimize are now the weights and the biases of this Boltzmann machine. So if we now go back to the, uh, to the drawing here, what we are going to have then is a set of uh, hidden layers. In our case, we're just gonna have one. So this is gonna be the hidden layer. And we are going to have a set of nodes here, which now we can choose how many we want to have. So I'm just going to write this as an H1, an H2, and this goes all the way down to H of N. So in our case, the notation which we are going to use here, if we now just look at what we also did here, we are going to simply replace that one with the following. So there will be a node X1, there will be a node x2 just to simplify our notation and this goes all the way down to the node the final number of nodes which we need and this is going to be a number which is given by n times the dimension of the system and similarly in here this is going to be m times the dimension of the system then uh, these different nodes here they are connected with the weights. So each one of these has a bias. So there's going to be an A, an A bias, which comes in here. This is the final one, which is N times D. This is going to have a bias, which we can call A1. Sorry, A1. We're going to have an A2, etc. We are similarly going to have a bias here, which we call for B1. There's be a bias here. So these are all parameters which we are going to train uh, our model in, in order to get the optimal uh, reproduction of the energy. And finally, what we have is a set of uh, links between the hidden nodes and the visible nodes. 
So all the visible nodes are connected to all the hidden nodes. So that's a basic structure of this network. And then we have, let me just complete the drawing here so that we can put in the different variables which we're getting. So these variables, if we now just take a node here, that's going to connect to another node here. And this is node i, and this is node j. So that's going to have a variable wij, which we need to optimize when we are setting up the, the algorithm. Now, the cost function which we need, or the function which we want to optimize now, is actually the, uh, the uh, uh, energy which we had before. So our wave function now, there are two uh, approaches to the wave function. So one is to assume now that the wave function squared, the trial wave function, is given by this uh, Boltzmann distribution. So let's go back here and set up the trial wave function, which now is given in terms of this Boltzmann distribution. So we could now say that the trial wave function is now simply given, the trial wave function squared is simply given by this term here, E of, and now I'm just gonna put the axis and the hidden nodes. And then we have finally the uh, uh, parameters theta. Now, what we are interested in, since the wave function depends only on psi, it means that what we need now is to calculate uh, this quantity here as a function where we now sum over all the hidden nodes. So that means that we get an object which depends only on x. Alternatively, what we can do then is, so that means that the wave function itself is actually the square root of this quantity. The other alternative is simply to say that, so this is alternative one. And as we discussed last week, this simply leads to us getting a problem where we have a, an additional factor of two when we take the log of the trial wave function. So the next thing is actually to assume that psi of t is simply equal to this term here. However, we can become a little bit more ambitious. So we can add more approaches. And this is something which we can do a little bit later as a kind of exploration, if you guys are interested. So we could now say that the, the trial wave function is not only the Boltzmann machine, but it contains some kind of physics guidance that means that uh, we could now plug in to the trial wave function some information which we have or some requirements which the physics gives us, which is not included in the Boltzmann machine. So this could, for instance, be something which relates to the symmetry of the wave function. So one thing which you see here is that if we are dealing with fermions and we are going to deal with many fermions, we won't have the proper symmetry of the wave function. So that means that we would need to multiply that with something like a, uh, a uh, Slater determinant, which would then take care of the symmetry for the anti-symmetry for fermions. Alternatively, we may also uh, want to add in some information about the correlations. So a typical thing which happens when we have a, a Hamiltonian which has a Coulomb type of interaction. So one of the things which we can easily deal with then with a interaction. So if we now look at the interaction between two particles, which depends on the relative distance, if we have an interaction which is proportional to the relative distance, this is the absolute value of the relative distance, by the way. If we have an interaction like that, then there is some minimal physics information which uh, we could actually bake into the wave function. So I'm going to say that there is a C correlation min, and you can actually show that that means that this has to go like E to the Rij multiplied with some parameter, which we can call for gamma. And that depends a little bit on the type of interaction which we have. But if we have a repulsive interaction like that one, we need to have a part in the wave function, which goes like the exponential of the, with the relative distance as an argument, 
because that will cancel a divergence in kinetic energy and a divergence in the potential energy if we have that specific form. So having a form like this means that divergences, when the relative distance goes to zero, they will be cancelled by that type of wave function. Now, this type of function which you see here is something which is a little bit more tricky to include into the Boltzmann machine itself. So what many people would do then is simply to take a wave function which contains the Boltzmann machine and multiply it with this term. So what we could think of is to have a psi of t now, and I'm writing this in a schematic way, which contains the restricted Boltzmann machine. So it's a, called a restricted Boltzmann machine because we are restricting the connections between the hidden layers and the visible layers. We are not allowing for self inter connections between the same layer. So that's why we call it restricted Boltzmann machine. So this calculation which we put up here, this one, this is something which I'm just going to label with a restricted Boltzmann machine. And then you could think of multiplying that with a parameter which goes like gamma or ij. And where this gamma becomes an additional variational parameter, which you could then optimize in your machinery. Alternatively, if you're dealing with a system of uh, many, many fermions, so we would then have uh, a wave function then. So this would be the wave function squared, which is would be a common way of doing that. And then we would actually have to square this quantity as well. So we would then take the Boltzmann machine as it comes, and then we would take this function and square it. Alternatively, we can just take psi of t and then put that one equal to the Boltzmann machine and multiply that with such a term. Another alternative is to, uh, so we could actually rewrite this as a Boltzmann machine times this uh, psi correlation minimum where we bake in some minimal physics insight. We could now add uh, a specific symmetry. So for fermions and also bosons, we know that the total wave function should be anti-symmetric or symmetric. So then the wave function psi has to be anti-symmetric. And one of the problems with many of these neural networks is that it's difficult to have the network to reproduce the proper symmetry, in particular if it's anti-symmetric. So what you could do then, if you have many fermions, or you can do that with two fermions as well, so like the case which we have now, the spatial part of the wave function is symmetric, but the spin part of the wave function has to be anti-symmetric. So when the wave function is symmetric, you have a symmetric part times an anti-symmetric part, that gives a total wave function which is anti-symmetric. So what you could do then is simply to set up a trial wave function, psi of t squared, which now contains a Slater determinant, so which is the product of single particle wave function squared. You could multiply that with a Boltzmann machine. So that's one simple way of including the uh, uh, requirement for anti-symmetry. Alternatively, you could also add the minimum correlation insights which you have. So you would multiply that with this psi c min squared. And you can now introduce additional variational parameters. So you can think of all these parameters as variational parameters. And the quantity which we end up calculating here, so the final quantity, the expected value of the energy, we know that that one uh, the derivative of that one. So we need the derivative of this with respect to all these parameters theta. And I'm writing this in a, in a generic way now because theta now contains the biases, the variances, no, it's not the biases and the, and the weights of the neural network. And it may also contain these additional parameters which we have plugged into the Slater determinant and the minimum uh, way of dealing with the correlations. By the way, feel free to ask questions if, if something is unclear here, because I'm just sketching the, uh, the basic uh, uh, philosophy which we need to implement when we are now setting up the codes. And then this quantity here is now, as before, 
it's going to be given by two and then we are going to have these expectation values so we would have an integral here where we have a psi we we have the function itself the derivative of the trial wave function psi t so i'm writing that marked with a psi here multiplied with the local energy minus and then we have the integral of a psi t divided by psi t so actually this should be it didn't look so nice on the whiteboard here so it should have minus and this integral of psi derivative and this is a derivative with respect to these variational parameters times the expected value of the energy here so this is a quantity which we are going to take the derivative of again and we know that uh, when we look at that specific uh, expression there this is something which we can simplify further by simply uh, noting that the, uh, the the wave function itself is actually given by the uh, uh, we, ha we have an integral of the derivative of the wave function uh, divided by the wave function itself so that means that we can actually rewrite that in terms of a logarithm so this kind of uh, quantity which we need to calculate now if we look at this specific term here that's actually the log of the trial wave function and that means that what we are going to look at now is a simplified term which was simplified don't know if it's simplified or not but we need to calculate this integral now taking the log of that one is something which simplifies some of the mathematics which we have in the equations above here so when i mention uh, this factor of two which comes in addition that depends on whether we use this specific form for the trial wave function and when we take a log of that we simply get an additional factor of two or whether we take this specific form because then we won't have this factor of two however the thing which is useful to keep in mind is that when we are evaluating this quantity it's actually the log of the trial wave function which we are setting up here so basically these are the uh, different approaches which we can take when we now are going to set up a uh, Boltzmann machine now when we've gotten familiar with the Boltzmann machine uh, if you still have time to do so uh, we can then start looking at the, the implementation of a neural network alternatively when you are working in groups so some of you could look at the neural network implementation and some of you could look at the Boltzmann machine implementation so the Boltzmann machine implementation for this specific problem is almost spelled out uh, in the lecture notes and after the small break here we are going to take a look at the, that specific code and the equations which we need to set up so we should take a small break now here if it's okay with you guys so i'm gonna so welcome back again if we now look at uh, what we had before the break uh, we have a uh, quantum mechanical system which we are now going to simulate with monte carlo methods but where we are going to replace or parts of fully uh, of, of everything of the wave function with a uh, Boltzmann machine this is the first step we're going to do now so if we just scroll back a little bit a Boltzmann machine is a system where we can actually keep changing uh, or generate new inputs it's not like a standard neural network where you would have a fixed input and a fixed output we are going to change both the inputs and the hidden nodes uh, according to a minimization uh, problem which in our case deals with finding the optimal parameters which simply set the derivative of the energy to zero so that's the gradient which we actually want to be equal to zero as a function of the different parameters now the network contains uh, input an input layer or normally this is something which is called a visible layer and that visible layer has a number of nodes which reflects in our case the number of particles and the dimensionality of the problem so for the case which we are going to look at in project number two we are going to have two particles and two dimensions so that means four 
uh, visible nodes. Uh, you can increase the number of uh, hidden nodes to go beyond four, but you can also keep them equal to four. So in the example codes which uh, we have here, I have been running examples with uh, the number of hidden nodes, which is uh, equal to the number of visible nodes. Uh, increasing the number of nodes obviously just increases the number of parameters you need to fine tune. So in principle, this means that what we're going to have is four inputs nodes and four hidden nodes. So that gives us eight biases, which needs to be tuned. And then we have the uh, matrix, uh, which uh, really gives us the weights. So that would be a four by four matrix in that case. So you will have 60 parameters, which need to be tuned. You can obviously increase this. You can add more hidden layers. Now, Boltzmann machines have traditionally been a little bit more difficult to uh, evaluate when you increase the number of hidden layers. Note also that there is no connection between the nodes in a given layer. And that leads to what's normally called a restricted Boltzmann machine. So we restrict the interactions to take place only between the nodes in the hidden layer and the nodes in the visible layer. So the um, uh, trial wave function, which we end up with, can be solely determined by the type of Boltzmann machine, which we end up with, like a typical Gaussian binary. And that means that the wave function, either the wave function squared or the wave function is given by this specific Boltzmann machine, which as we have here in the slide here, this is highlighted by this equation here. That's the way we define the Boltzmann machine. And the quantity which we want to evaluate is, or the quantity we actually want to minimize. So this defines what in machine learning is called the uh, cost function. So this is the function we want to drive to zero. And in this specific case, it's the uh, same function which we calculated in project number one. That means the derivative of the energy as a function of the variational parameter. In our case, the parameters are now the weights and the biases of a neural network, in this case, a Boltzmann machine. Alternatively, uh, we can add uh, some physics insights which we have about the system in this trial wave function. There's nothing which hinders us to guide the network with some specific physics insights. And one of the problems which basically all these kind of neural network approaches have had is to give us the correct anti-symmetry if we're dealing with fermions. Then uh, we have a correlated pass of the wave function, which in our case can be modeled depending on uh, the type of interaction which we have with uh, some physics insights. So a typical minimum requirement of the correlated wave function, if you have a repulsive potential, which is given by a constant divided by the relative distance, then uh, we can actually show that there is a divergence in the kinetic energy if you're dealing with a two-dimensional or higher dimensional system, which has to cancel the divergence in the potential energy. Because else, when you're bringing the particles very close to each other, the potential energy may diverge. There is a similar factor if you look at the two particle relative uh, kinetic energy. So you're making a transformation from uh, the laboratory frame where you have the positions of particle one and two in this case, and you transform that to the central mass variable and the relative distance variable, then there's going to be a term in the kinetic energy which goes like one divided by the relative distance multiplied with the derivative of the wave function with respect to the relative distance. So that term has to cancel the divergence in the potential energy. So that gives us some kind of minimal requirements, which we can actually bake in. And these minimal requirements, which we have here, they can also have parameters, which we can optimize. So there's nothing which hinders us for doing that. So if you have time and you wish to explore uh, options like that, I mean, feel free to do that in this project here. Then, uh, since you're going to have something which is uh, pretty similar to a neural network. If you feel that you have the time for it, we can then 
extend this model here or actually replace the Boltzmann machine with a standard neural network. What's going to happen then is that what you will need is actually this piece here. So when you're doing your neural network training and setting up the cost function, your cost function is this quantity here. And it means that you need to evaluate these derivatives as you back propagate the weights and the biases and do the training of the weights and the biases with a standard neural network. So for those of you who are familiar with neural networks, feel free to explore this possibility. And I would typically recommend uh, exploring that using software like TensorFlow or PyTorch, unless you want to write your own code for doing that. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go a little bit back to the uh, uh, slides, and I wanted to link these ingredients with the code uh, and the equations here, and show and point to you the uh, uh, bits and pieces which you would need to have in the project. So let me switch over to the uh, uh, slides. So what I'm showing now is the uh, slides which you will find when you look into the lecture notes on the Boltzmann machines. So what we have uh, is, this is just a summary of what we did. So we would now have a Boltzmann machine, which is given by this function E here, which has a visible layer and a hidden layer. You put T zero equal to one. And then uh, you can then define the so-called marginal distribution, which is the quantity we are interested in because that is going to be the final wave function. It's going to take the positions of the particles as arguments. So that means that we would have to sum over this h. Now, this mathematics is done here, so you don't need to do that yourself. It means that the uh, uh, calculations which you would need to add, or the elements which you would need to add in your code, would be a function of uh, the uh, all the dimensions you have. So m here now is the total number of uh, visible nodes, and uh, uh, n here is now the total number of uh, hidden nodes. So remember now that this number is equal to the number of particles times the dimensionality of the system. So this is the analytical expression which you would need to plug into the code. And where you now have the weights here, we're going to put the sigma squared equal to one. We have the biases, and then we have the uh, parameters A here. So we're going to take derivatives with respect to these parameters and then optimize the uh, energy with respect to that. And there are, as we mentioned before the break, there are two ways of doing that. One is to set the wave function equal to the Boltzmann machine, or the other one is actually to uh, go back and say that the wave function is the, uh, the square wave function is actually equal to this Boltzmann machine. And that means that the, the wave function itself is now going to be the square root of this quantity here. Now the partition function disappears in the Monte Carlo machinery because we uh, actually never use uh, the partition function since we are taking ratios between wave functions. And the equations which you see here, which I provide you with here, are the equations which uh, you would have to program. And since we are going to take the log when we calculate the cost function, so the, uh, the gradient of that function is now given by uh, three integrals one which contains the local energy operator multiplied with this quantity here, which becomes the logarithm, as you can see here. So that's the logarithm of the function. And then we have a separate integral from the local energy as we had in project one, and similarly, a separate integral for the logarithm of the, the derivative of the logarithm with respect to the weights and the biases and additional variational parameters. So that means that when we take the log of this quantity here, things simplify a little bit. And when we are going to calculate the energy here, we are simply going to need different derivatives. And this is actually what is coded into the, uh, into the code here. So if we scroll down and we skip some of these details and just rather take a look at the code, 
you will now see that the trial wave function here takes as input the uh, positions of the particles. So this is R. It takes the biases for the visible layer, the biases for the hidden layer, and the weights here. And in our case, I'm just putting this sigma equal to 1 because I don't want to calculate it. And sometimes when you don't want to calculate it, just put it to 1. Then I have my uh, term here for the uh, visible layer, which you can see here, which is now my so-called uh, Gaussian factor. So that is going to be, for the harmonic oscillator case, this is going to be pretty close to what we are having for the harmonic oscillator. So keep this in mind that if we use a Gaussian binary, we already have parts of the exact wave function in terms of this uh, piece here, which now depends on the uh, on the uh, on the difference between the uh, position and the weight uh, and sort of the bias value. And here we have an array which now loops over the uh, number of particles and the dimensionality. Then there is a piece here which now runs only over the hidden part of the wave function. And if we go back a little bit, you will see now that the hidden part of the wave function is now given by, so what is being coded there is actually this term which you see here. Actually, it's the square of that term. And the uh, uh, final trial wave function which we have is now going to simply to be the product of these two terms here. And you can see now that you have the, the Psi of I uh, 1, which now contains this uh, Gaussian part. And then we have the, uh, the part which now contains the, uh, the hidden part. And this function Q here actually sets up the two additional terms which we need. Then, finally, we have the local energy which we need to calculate. And that is very, very close to what we have before, except that now I'm calculating the log of these two functions, C of I1 and C of I2. So the C of I1 contains information about the visible layer, and C of I2 is the one which now takes the hidden layer. And when you look at this expression here and you go back and look at the mathematics, you will see essentially that what I've done here is simply to calculate this system here uh, by implementing the equations which you will find in the slides above the, the code here. So this should be a pretty straightforward uh, application of uh, the uh, equations which are spelled out in, in the lecture notes. And then uh, we can also add the interaction if we want, and this returns the local energy. Then we need to take the derivatives so the expression for the derivatives which you have, and this goes back here. So all these manipulations which you see here, they actually baked into these expressions for the derivatives. And you will then find this derivative ansatz here. This is a wave function ansatz that simply sets up these different derivatives. Now, one thing you could do, which uh, I actually recommend, because that means that it's easier to set up other types of trial wave function. So in this specific code, what you see now is that we uh, are calculating everything analytically. So my advice to you is actually to try to use the uh, automatic differentiation. So like using JAX, or if you are still using AutoDiff, you can use AutoDiff, and use auto diff automatic differentiation to calculate these quantities. That will save you a lot of time, in particular if you wish to use other types of wave functions. So uh, all the equations which you see here, they are analytical manipulations of uh, a Gaussian binary machine. However, when you now are uh, setting, if you want to set up a more general wave function, you could actually replace many of these uh, uh, derivatives which are needed in the local energy and also in the derivative of the, uh, the trial wave function as a function of the parameters and also in the quantum force here because you see here that what I have done is actually to hard code the uh, analytical expression for the quantum forces. So 
since uh, I saw that many of you in project number one, you actually used automatic differentiation, then I would normally recommend to do that because the time you waste on developing the analytical equations through paper and pencil is much, much longer than the time you're going to use by running automatic differentiation. So the uh, speed up you gain by using analytical expressions cannot be compared with the total development and runtime. So your runtime with analytical expressions is normally shorter, typically a factor of two than the uh, automatic differentiation. But if you're running a calculation which takes a day and it took you a week to uh, develop all the analytical e equations, and then if you're going to add a new type of wave function and it would take you another week and it still just takes nothing but more than a day to run the calculations, then your time in, uh, is in, in actually extracting these analytical equations is perhaps almost wasted. So it's always useful to run an analytical calculation. However, uh, this gives you very little flexibility. And with the tools like automatic differentiation, uh, which implement uh, the chain rule through repeated uh, actions, this is a much more efficient way of uh, doing scientific programming. So my advice now is when you do this project, and this could be a, something which is a, a useful thing to look at. So try to uh, uh, perhaps copy these equations, implement them. And then when you have a running code, try to replace everything with automatic differentiation. And you will then see that you will have much more flexibility in introducing other types of equations for the wave function. In particular, if you now want to uh, implement the calculation of a, with a neural network. So with a neural network, the thing which I'm going to do is actually to replace the correlated part of the wave function with a neural network. That is normally the best way. You can also use these Boltzmann machines as an input uh, to a neural network calculations. So the Boltzmann machine will not give you the exact answer because it will depend uh, on the type of uh, Boltzmann machine you use. And remember that what you're doing is a strict variation calculation. So it will find the minimum energy which corresponds to that specific wave function you are plugging in to the calculations. So I'm bringing up all these aspects because these are things which are uh, important to think about when you want to move on. So the first step is actually to look at what is in these slides and try to implement it yourself and try to understand the basics of these Boltzmann machines. But then if you replace everything with automatic differentiation, it's much easier to actually uh, implement a neural network. So this is uh, something which is useful to think of in, in the long term run. Then we have the answers for the derivative here. We have the quantum force, as we said, and then we have what you see here. And these are the elements which you have in the code. This is a standard approach, which you did in project number one as well. We implement important sampling and we have to calculate the quantum force in the old positions and the quantum force in the new positions. And then what we need are actually the derivatives of the energy we have the, the derivatives of this function psi, and then the derivative of the wave function multiplied with the energy. So these are the three integrals which we need to set up. And uh, the uh, uh, thing which follows here is essentially what you have seen before. So the reason why I also repeat a little bit of this is that I want you to think about possible strategies and how you can move on after you implemented the Boltzmann machine. So here we have the, the plain uh, uh, important sampling part with the calculation of the Green's function as before, nothing is changed here. So this piece is a piece which uh, basically stays the same. And 
Uh, finally, you calculate these uh, contributions to the integrals for the derivatives of the wave function. And here, again, I have this very, very, uh, how to say, uh, in addition to calculating the, the uh, uh, derivatives, you see now that my iterative scheme here is still in the same primitive iterative scheme. So in a certain sense, I'm not giving you uh, all the advanced options and you should actually think of bringing that, those in yourself. And when you are uh, implementing this with a neural network, for instance, then you can use via TensorFlow or PyTorch or similar tools, you can then use all the gradient uh, optimization methods which, you, which some of you are familiar with. So here I'm just doing the max iterations and calculating the derivatives. And you can see now that the, my energy, so this is an example of a run here. And uh, after 50 iterations, you can now see that my energy is just fluctuating around two. So this is a non-interacting case, as you can see. And uh, the Boltzmann machine, since it already had this term, uh, which looks like a harmonic oscillator wave function in the Gaussian part of the Boltzmann machine, we already have important elements of the wave functions. If I had changed this to binary binary, I would not have gotten the same results. Uh, if we now want to uh, add the, uh, the interaction here, so we can always uh, do that and see what happens. So let's do that and just simply rerun this code. Now the exact, this is a system which has an exact energy, which is exactly equal to three. And you can see now that this Boltzmann machine has no information about this optimal uh, wave function, which needs to include a kind of minimum information about the correlations. So when I had the plain Boltzmann machine, which already contained the uh, type of harmonic oscillator functions, I was actually spot on here. So one thing you can think of is actually to multiply this Boltzmann machine with a, uh, okay, so this wanted me to reload here. Uh, okay, overwrite. So you can see now that the energy keeps oscillating around something from 3.2 to 3.3. And these are the final results of the 50 iterations here. And uh, you see now that you're missing uh, important elements in the, in the wave function. You could obviously try to increase the complexity of the uh, Boltzmann machine. And in our case, we have uh, fixed uh, the number of uh, particles to be two, and we have two uh, dimensions. So that means that they have four visible nodes. And we can now, these are things which one can actually change when you're setting up your uh, calculations here. So you could now define, as you can see here, what I've done here is to say that the number of hidden is equal to two, dimensions two, and number of particles is two. I can clearly change the number of hidden modes. I can add complications to the system. So feel free to play around a little bit with these codes here. And then we can, uh, uh, when, when you have implemented this, then we can start looking at uh, whether we would like to move on and implement uh, a neural network. Because when you have this machinery up, you actually have many of the basic elements which are needed in order to calculate a neural network. So in the neural network, you would use everything which you have here, so this would be, in principle, these are your integrals which are needed in a neural network. The uh, only difference is that now the uh, wave function itself, if we now go back to the uh, whiteboard, so let me just stop this one and feel free to ask questions if you have. But if we now go back to the whiteboard and look at the next stage, So if we now uh, have implemented with a Boltzmann machine implemented, so let me just bring this up with an RBM. Implemented properly, 
what we could think of doing then, we can then replace the RBN with a neural network. And the way we can do this now is as follows. So here, what we have in, in, in this part, which we have been discussing, our trial wave function psi of t is now proportional to this function, which we call an RBM. And this RBM is now given by an energy, which is given by a Gaussian plus a binary part. So a binary part for the hidden layers. So when you have this kind of structure, what you could do is obviously to multiply this. So you could have a new wave function, psi of t, which is proportional to an RBM, the same RBM, but then you could multiply this with a psi c min correlation and see if that actually improves the calculations which you see here. And if you do that, you will actually see that the uh, calculations are improved. Now, when you then uh, have done these calculations, you could use this as a kind of this trial function, as a kind of input to uh, a neural network. Use this, because then you have a trial wave function. Use this RBM as input. So that means that we just take this piece, we don't use the, uh, the other part, as input to a neural network. And what I'm going to write now is this neural network as a function of Ri, R1. Let me just rewrite this in a more compact way as we did previously. So this neural network now would be a function which depends on the positions of the particles. We could actually give some information about the correlations. So we could train the network to uh, respect the fact that we are interested in uh, quantities which depends on the relative distance as well. Then this will now contain the parameters which we have here. So that means that the wave function we can choose different strategies. So psi of t could then be equal to n of r of theta. And we would then initialize the neural network either by some guess which we have, or we could take the Boltzmann machine which we have and use that one as a first guess for the neural network. And with that wave function, we would have to calculate the derivatives with respect to the variational parameters. So now the wave function is a neural network. Now, we could now change this neural network to simply be given by this n of r neural network of theta multiplied with some minimum physics insight. So we could uh, uh, since we know that we have a repulsive Coulomb type of interaction, we could simply say that our trial wave function should now contain such a correlated part, which we normally call a Jastrow factor. So in project one, we used to call this a Jastrow factor or a correlated part of the wave function or and so on. Then clearly what you could also do, since you know that this is a harmonic oscillator, the next stage could be actually to take a psi harmonic oscillator for the particles which are involved. So you have a harmonic oscillator which you could take from your variational calculation where you have found the optimal parameters for the harmonic oscillator. You could multiply that with a psi c min. And finally, let the neural network explore the rest. So you can guide the neural network to uh, uh, depend, for instance, only on the coordinates of the particles, but you could also bake some conditions on that it should also depend on the relative distance.
and then let the neural network find the remaining correlations. So you see there are several strategies. So one of the strategies which normally works best is a strategy where you try to uh, take this harmonic oscillator part and multiply that with a neural network and then let the uh, neural network find the uh, remaining degrees of freedom. So the reason why I would like to focus on the Boltzmann machine first is that this is something which is all has a very, very close overlap with project number one. So you can reuse basically everything you did in project one, but replace the trial wave function with a Boltzmann machine. And you will see that for the uh, uh, non-interacting case, the fact that you have a Gaussian binary expression for the energy, that will give you a result which is going to be pretty close to the exact result, which in our case in two dimensions and with an h bar omega equal to one is going to be equal to two. And you saw that from the simulations which we run. However, when you bring in the interaction, then the Boltzmann machine does not have any information about the physics here. So that would be the same as you running the variation of Monte Carlo calculation without the uh, correlated part, but only taking into account the single particle piece of the wave function. So what I would like to propose now is that uh, we, uh, uh, as groups, we just uh, keep working on these projects. And then, depending on where we are, we can then say that when you're done with the Boltzmann machines, and if you want to move on and do more advanced studies with neural networks, then we could take it from there. But the first step is actually to uh, get a Boltzmann machine to function. And that would be our entry point to uh, deep learning methods with, uh, with uh, a Boltzmann machine as the uh, method which we are going to use. So I'm going to stop the recording here. And then we can...